All right, I'm going to get started uh, since we're about five minutes off now. All right, so like Tim said, uh, I'm Mike Jungluth. I work at Zenimax Online. Uh, currently, we're finishing up Elder Scrolls Online. And prior to Zenimax, I've, I've really worked at a handful of, of different studios on, on an assortment of different games. And it seems like at every studio, on every game, we seem to run into a similar problem which is how can we essentially take all that great, awesome stuff that Jaleel was talking about, all that stuff about really studying a performance and, and figuring out what's unique to the character, how can we do that not just on, on these main characters that, that are featured on the covers, but actually to all those secondary NPC characters in the game that, that never seem to get the, the right amount of love, right? Um, uh, of course, the big reason why that doesn't seem to happen is, is what we always hear, right? There's not enough time, there's not enough resources, so unlike the main characters, which usually have defined traits and objectives that everyone on the team is aware of, NPCs oftentimes are just a uh, name on a page with maybe, at best, a short bio, some random abilities assigned to them, which, of course, leads to characters that can feel generic, unrelated to the world, to each other, or, or to the player, right? And to top it off, everyone on the team may actually have a different idea as to what any of those traits are for a character when they're implementing their aspect of the character into the game, right? So, with so many characters and production time always limited, what we really need to do and what we want to do is create a dedicated process for creating an ecology. All right, so what do I mean when I say ecology? Well, the, the textbook definition is uh, it's the study of how organisms interact amongst their environment and one another. For our purposes and for the purposes of this talk, when I say ecology, what I mean is how a character fits into the world. So what follows are some of the approaches I've been a part of on different games to try and do that, to create a process for establishing an ecology. Because most oftentimes, a lot of these problems actually become most glaring mid-production, uh, they really are created to be adapted into any workflow at any point. But of course, like anything, the sooner you can get these into the pipeline, uh, the sooner they're established, the more beneficial they'll be. All right, so the first step to create a process that allows you to find a character's personality as, as quickly as possible. Uh, the way to do that is, of course, with defining their objective. Every single person in their life operates with some sort of objective, right? It could be that the objective is enough money to, you know, to save up enough money to buy a house. That could be one. Or to be liked by someone in particular. Or simply just to survive. Whatever it is, without a provable and concrete objective, a character has no connection to their world, and we're really unable to empathize with them. Oftentimes, the objective of an NPC is really simply defined as, as either impeding or helping the player, right? But we know that's way too broad for animation purposes, and honestly, it's even too mechanically shallow for designers, right? But oftentimes, this is all we have to go on when we're given a new character. So let's start from there, right? If that's all you have, Let's get a universal touchstone that we can use to quickly establish a character's specific objective. For my purposes, I like to use Maslow's hierarchy of needs, as it can quickly classify a character and give focused direction on how to brainstorm. What each level of the pyramid depicts is the needs that drive the decisions uh, and lifestyle of the person living within it. Right? Uh, everything below the level that they're at is already established to them, they don't even care about it, like they don't have to worry about it anymore. So essentially, how a character that functions within the esteem block, right, which is focused primarily on respect, how they react to the world would be entirely different than someone in the physiological block, who's driven by the bare essentials to survive. All right, so let's, let's see how this works. Uh, this is when I used it uh, on Elder Scrolls Online. So the problem was we started with a graveyard that was full of skeletons. And we were trying to figure out some animations we could give them to spice up the scene a little bit. But in a way that didn't make them seem like the normal undead zombie creatures you've seen a million times in a million games, right? So 
I went to the hierarchy, and, and I looked to see where they might fall. And uh, it was pretty clear that they don't really have any physiological needs, right? Like, they don't need to breathe or eat or drink or, or anything like that, right? So then I move up to the next one, which is safety. And instantly, a lot more ideas came into to what they could be doing. The way I saw it, skeletons were essentially guardians, right? With a single focus in their actions, which was to protect this graveyard, right? They were essentially like the, the soldiers posted at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier at Arlington, Virginia. And, uh, you know, instantly, their, their whole purpose became a lot more clear, right? They didn't seem like zombies anymore, which exists really only on that physiological block, right? The need to eat or being driven by that want to survive, you know? And, and I think that's a big reason why when you don't have something in place, uh, oftentimes, since physiological needs are, are the go-to behavior because they're so basic of what everyone understands, when you're not given time, that's where you're instantly going to oftentimes put characters and, and creatures and probably explains why zombies are so prevalent and easily successful in games, right? Because they match. But to take it even one step further and complete the undead holy trinity, uh, we can also define ghosts, which is important because we have a lot of those as well. Um, and those are above both safety and physiological needs and operate really only for emotional purposes. So they're driven by love and belonging as that's often the unfinished business that, that keeps them from passing on. So by using the hierarchy and simply identifying where all three of these token undead types fell, uh, they can feel unique to themselves but still be grounded within the same world. But that's only the first step in this process. Uh, because oftentimes, even within those hierarchies, uh, you're going to have overlap in specific defining traits. So to drill down uh, even a bit further, but not lose their driving objective, rather than create that typical character lineup you've seen a million times, we had an idea, why not try to line up the groups? And the way this came about was to fix an issue we kept running into while, while doing uh, R&D on, on Shadows of Mordor at uh, Monolith. See, how intelligent enemies were in regards to one another got really muddy, and, and we were kind of in the weeds about, about how it should work. A sticking point that we kept getting hung up on was that while cave trolls are rather dumb, we wanted a version that was more intelligent, uh, one that might have been able to be trained and, and educated to actually command an army, not just be a wrecking ball that, that runs through it. And while we wanted that, we still wanted to make sure that they maintained that core feeling of a troll, right, so that they still had their objective. So when we tried to do a traditional lineup that you've seen uh, where we thought everyone would belong, our opinions were all over the map. So the idea of, you know, why not try lining up the groups? So the way that works is I started with enemies that were animals. And those were, you know, obviously easily grouped by their nature, as well as being primarily physiologically driven on the hierarchy, which is signified by their, their red bar. Um, on one end of the lineup was spiders, right? They're not very intelligent. But on the other end was wards, which are apparently quite intelligent creatures. Then as more creatures needed to be added to the lineup, we can easily do so while still staying true to the needs of their hierarchy. So if great eagles became enemies, they would go to the end of the block and, and push the wards towards the middle. Then you bring in the next group. In this case, the root of our problems, which was the trolls. Again, you do the same as last time. But this time, also line up the group in relation to the animals group. Here we can see that a warg would scoff at taking orders from a cave troll, but would certainly respect the commands of a, of a more intelligent captain. On it goes, so we bring in the next group, which is goblins. Um, they're much more communal, as you can see by being yellow, uh, and driven by some basic sociological needs on the hierarchy. So while they are higher on it, they're clearly not much smarter than trolls, making it clear that they could be commanded by a trained troll. Bring in the orcs, who are driven by needs of respect, esteem, and achievement, yet intelligence-wise, grunts could still be dumber than a troll or a goblin. And then, as a reference point, the elves, who just are way beyond everything else of those brutal creatures, right? So, while a standard lineup of characters can give you a lot of the same animation or the same information. By grouping them, you can quickly identify and modify their relation to key traits while maintaining the consistency of their objective and needs. 
right? And if a new character is, is created for the game, it can quickly be added into the group without throwing the other groups and characters out of whack. So there, there it was, that's what we were missing, kind of a, a big picture that we could establish and maintain quite easily. But like everything, that's not enough. Uh, and we needed to drill down even further. Specifically, we wanted to be able to quickly compare individual characters against one another. Uh, but the answer to this one uh, wasn't creative or methodical. Uh, actually, it was very methodical, and it comes from math, right? It's a coordinate graph. So this one we didn't come up with on our own. I found this in uh, Jesse Sell Shell's The Art of Game Design. Uh, who owns this book? Awesome. Everyone in here should own it. Without a doubt, this is one of those game design books that every animator should have on their shelf right next to The Illusion of Life. All right, so the way this works. You start by creating an axis with two sets of binary traits on each end. For our purposes, we needed to define how a character is applied or modified the intelligence within what we used in the groups um, to one another. So we used sly to inept, wild to civil, and then on the second graph, uh, dominant to submissive and evil to good, as those often seem to come up as well. Then create a key. Uh, with the characters you want. Again, use the colors of the hierarchy, right? It helps to keep the needs and, and visual language consistent across all this stuff. We also added the player character uh, as a reference point. So to start, uh, place a dot within the spectrum that represents each character on the game. So the warg is, is certainly wild, right? Yet slightly sly. It's also rather evil and, and slightly dominant. And then on it goes with each character. And quickly you'll find how similar or unique your characters are. If you find a few characters are, are plotting almost identically, then either move one to an open area of the chart, or if you need to, cut it. Likewise, when a new character is being created, you can easily see where an opening exists for that specifically needed personality. So we needed somebody in like Civil and Inept, right? Maybe that would be a, a good buddy cop or I don't know. Lord of the Rings had buddy cops, right? I know the lore. Uh, yeah. uh, button cases where characters are inherently rather similar to, to others in some ways, such as was the case with Yorks. They kind of were close to some others. You can uh, quickly compare one against the rest uh, using coordinate graphs as well. Simply place the character's dot in the center of the graph like the orc in this instance. Then plot the other character's dots in relation to the specific traits of the orc. Instantly, you'll see how they would behave if, if one another was in a scene with each other and how the social hierarchies would be established and, and actually play out. All right, so by this point, you'll know what their objective is and how they would go about their life within the world to try and achieve it, right? You've got that base knowledge kind of figured out. Uh, the last visual chart I like to, to use then is, is a path chart. And what this does is this will show how a character is meant to path throughout the world. So when you deliver the animations to designers and world builders and, and audio people, uh, their, their pathing is, is going to be consistent with the personality of the animations you created. So let's return to uh, the skeletons and, and zombies of Elder Scrolls to show this in practice. So the skeleton, which we established was like those militant-esque robot guardians, right? Uh, they would travel in like straight, uninterrupted lines, like you've seen in, in other games, right? Uh, and when they need to turn, right, they wouldn't just turn like this. You know, they're gonna they're gonna stop, turn, and then walk, right? That needs to be consistent with with how they're actually moving in the animation. Contrast this with how the zombies would move, right? And they they stumble and lurch to their destination. They're all over the place, right? Uh, I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's like they're sensing that next bit of food that they want or they've even forgotten where it is they're going. And then when it turns, you know, it's not going to turn like that, that same robot uh, skeleton. It's going to, you know, it's going to go way out and then come back in, whatever. Make it messy, uh, right? I mean, these are, these are obviously the behaviors you're building already into the animation, right? But if a zombie is given a path like a skeleton, no matter how successful your animation, I mean, you got, if you've got this and it's in a straight line, 
that just it feels at odds, and it's 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 not gonna it's not gonna feel as good as if you actually paid attention to that passing. All right. So now that you've established and defined all these charts, right, for your purposes, you want to create a one sheet with all of these charts together that you can have to quickly remind yourself when you're coming back to a character or or as you're working throughout it. Uh, not just for yourself, though, but so that you can hand this off to, to other people working on it. Because remember, that's, that's half the problem, is everyone might have a different opinion on, on how these characters should work in the game. And that's the beauty of these charts, right? Once everyone working on the characters knows the, the visual language that's established, you can quickly refer to the one sheet and get all the information that, that's needed without reading or, or, let's be honest, skimming, right, a, a giant lengthy bio. Think of this as a visual, uh, you know, TLDR. So in the case of the goblins, by looking at their one sheet, we know they are highly communal. We can see how intelligent, submissive, and, and cruel they are in relation to one another. Uh, we can also see how they would move through spaces, often stopping to inspect the world and others around them. And, and they're also aware or scared enough of, of other things in their ecosystem to always be looking ahead and turning or, or getting out of the way of, of others long before the, the movement's actually required. That should be enough to, to get everyone on, onto the same page in a flash. And if, if they really want more info, they can go back to that giant lore bio or whatever if, if they really need it. Okay, so that's the first half of ecology, right? How they interact with one another. But uh, the second half is, is equally important, and that's how they interact with their environment. And for this, we refer to everyone's favorite principle, staging. It's one of those 12 principles that always is cited as, as being lost to game animation, right? But we know it, it really isn't lost. Uh, it's, it's simply in the hands of other disciplines oftentimes. So level designers, world builders, content designers. Oftentimes, they're the ones in control of staging the character using your animations. And... They might even just have a giant large database that they're pulling animations from, right, that you don't necessarily have control over. So it's important to empower them, to, to give them a pair of glasses that will allow them to see the world in the, the same way as your trained animator eye. Recommending books, writing docs, all that's a fine first step. And honestly, they're, they're pretty helpful for you because they allow you to get incredibly specific with the principles and explanations and put all your thoughts into paper in long form. But just like when we were defining the character's personality and, and when we're given a bio, uh, a wall of text isn't the end goal. And even if it is read, it's not really probably going to be returned to after that first viewing. So how can we make a more visual and, and quickly digested approach when we're, when we're talking to designers and, and other uh, creators? Early on when I started at ZeniMax, uh, a part of the group I was on was to help define and improve staging of areas within the game. To get away from a wall of text, I took a screenshot, uh, so this is a few years ago, uh, and uh, it was of the Mages Guild. And I asked the questions that I thought most important to the scene in the player. Who looks to be the most important person within the building? If I was going to ask someone here about joining the guild, their name's the Magister, uh, who would that be? Which characters look to be trainers, and which character is the vendor? So in the big picture, I don't know if you can tell any of that stuff. All right, so these are the answers, right? And, and there's a few issues here. Uh, first off, everyone's really far away from you the moment you walk into the door, right? This is supposed to be a big lived-in place, but everyone's in the back. Uh, worst of all is, is the magister, who's, you know, the admissions officer for all intents and purposes. And they're the front-facing person of the guild. Why are they back there? The vendor is appropriately behind the counter, but they're lost within the pillar and missing a perfect opportunity to be framed within the environment. And the trainers aren't in places or postures that would be associated with such a role. So using my quick and dirty Photoshop skills, uh, I restaged it so that they could see quickly how the scene could look better. So make it so that the moment the player enters the space, you break the room into uh, three planes of foreground, middle ground, and background, with thought given to which characters the player would most often be interacting with when they're coming into the space. The magisters brought up front to greet visitors and, and talk to new prospects. The trainers are moved to the middle ground and, and given actions that are appropriate to their title. 
and the vendor is moved to be framed within the archway of the bookshelf while still being behind the counter. And a role that I thought was missing, that of a headmaster or, or person in charge, uh, was put up on the walkway above using the verticality to imply higher social standing. So with a few pictures, essentially eliminates a lot of a doc's need, right? But even that, they're going to see that and they go, okay, how do I, I didn't know that stuff. How do I think about this stuff? How do I keep it in mind all the time? So what I wanted to do is give a cheat sheet that they can stick up at their desk for reference, right? You've got post-it notes and all that stuff posted to yours. They need something similar. So for our purposes, I broke that picture into, uh, into a few sections. First up was finding the character's objective, right? Uh, what do they want? What actions reflect that? And what emotions are they feeling? And to answer that last question, I included visuals of, of the seven universal emotions. Uh, not to mention having the faces on there add some life to the page as well as subtly influencing the person reading it to always be more aware of the mood of the scene. That's really important. Keep that in mind, like Julia was saying. You need to think of what happened before and after and what they're actually feeling. Next, how do these characters fit together? How, what are the relationships and social hierarchies? Who's the star of the scene? Where do they expect help or danger to come from? In, in all of these, right, it's that one sheet becomes important again because a lot of that's defined for them already. But the characters, the NPCs, aren't the only ones in the scene, and their reaction to the player, of course, needs to be taken into account as that's often either a direct help or hindrance in, in completing their objective. So are they expecting the player to arrive? What were they doing before the player shows up? And what do they want to do after the player leaves? And then finally, a reminder of the shot elements that were used within the example. Where's the primary entrance or exit of the scene? Define the three planes and make use of framing devices within the environment. In, in all of these little cheat sheets, I was conscious not to have more than three bullet points. Because honestly, at that point, people are just going to stop reading and, and you want something they can quickly glance and, and hopefully internalize, right? And then, of course, the most important thing, when in doubt, act it out, right? So once you've got a doc and a one sheet and all that good stuff, you need to get it out there to people as, as many ways as possible. Email, put it up on an internal directory, print it out and give it to the people in each department you know will evangelize it and really glom onto it. Hold a workshop that, that covers it and allows for Q&A. Sit down with people one-on-one -on -one to help put it into practice. Relying on only one or two of these methods isn't going to cut it. I've tried, and it fails every time. OK, interactions between characters, check. Their environment, check. The, the final piece of the puzzle and how this all informs their personality uh, is specifically how they engage with the player, yet maintain their established ecology. Here's a story I imagine sounds like one that you may have experienced yourself. On Singularity, while many of the creatures had defined personality traits within their animations, all their gameplay and abilities seemed to boil down to really the same thing. Uh, they had a melee attack if you got close, a ranged projectile attack if you stood far, and usually some sort of scream when they became aware of you. Making their combat match the personalities we put within the animation was honestly something we were really struggling with. But when armed with what makes characters tick, there's actually a, a great tool inherent to the medium that we can use to help define and connect their gameplay with their personality. Remember when in doubt, act it out. Uh, I've got like one minute. All right, let's go. Our solution came from the game's multiplayer, which, to give it a more unique spin, had creatures as playable on, on one team and soldiers on the other. While originally we were worried it would force us to change the personalities we had established within our animations, actually, once we took control of them, it was the gameplay weaknesses that, that came about because the animations had the personality. Forcing ourselves to actually role play to step into their shoes within the game, we knew what they wanted to do in a way that just acting them out at our desk actually couldn't. So in the instance of the revert, which was that dreaded zombie uh, affliction again, uh, we, we didn't know what to do for a long time. And uh, while we had the personality would have like a wounded animal that would have this interesting contrast of agony versus adrenaline emotionally, uh, playing it actually helped us figure out how it should actually attack and fight. We want, see, we needed to make it actually a bit slower and, and pack a harder punch. 
with a high tolerance for pain, right? Like a wounded animal, they don't, they don't necessarily feel that because they've, they've got all this adrenaline going. Uh, and we realized that we had this charge and rush attack that just wasn't appropriate. Honestly, they should force you to come to them. Uh, so we gave it a proximity mine, like a mucus thing, so it could corral soldiers into a desired location. It was given a medium range vomit to, uh, to blur their, their vision so they couldn't escape. And then a sonar-like ability to see through walls and, and planar ambush. And just like that, the idea of a wounded animal really started to match uh, the personality and the gameplay and the, and the animation. All right, and that's, and that's really what it's about, right? Like role-playing, acting. You know, we want to sit and we want to focus on that cool craft stuff that Jaleel was talking about. We want to sit there and think about these little ticks and moments. But oftentimes we're not setting ourselves up to a point or given enough information to be able to spend the time to think that because we're having to define this base layer. The quicker you can come up with a system like this, use this one, create your own, whatever, the quicker you're going to be able to get those core things of knowing who that character is out of the way so then you can really take the time to, to figure out what makes them unique within themselves. So, thank you. Uh, I don't think there's a... Uh, uh, I don't think we have time for questions, but uh, that's my contact information on Twitter and email. I'd love to talk to you guys about this. Um, I think we're also going to have overflow Q&A today uh, after six in, in an overflow room, we can figure that out. Um.